This is Sun from Symbologin. Welcome to Five Wars Don't Stop Dragons. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons. I'm your host, Carrie Parker. Today we have episode 308 for January 23rd, 2023. First of all, happy Data Privacy Week. That's all week this week. And as usual, I will have a blog post on this that'll post on Sunday. But I've got a data privacy checklist that I kind of maintain, and we'll be updating with that as well. I've got a link in the show notes. You can check it out now, but you might want to wait a week uh, and check it out or check out my related blog article on this. It'll come out Sunday, uh, well, along with my newsletter, where I will have updated that for uh, 2023. I tried to go back and touch that at least once a year right around data privacy week time. Also, the annual listener survey has been going well. I've gotten several responses. Thank you for everyone who has replied so far. For those of you who have not done it, you have one week left. If you have been meaning to do it, now is the time. Uh, again, there is a link on the show notes to this. If you can remember it, though, it's just fdsd.me, uh, yeah, as in Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons, fdsd.me, M-E, slash survey 2023. And again, even if you like everything I'm doing, that's important for me to know, because otherwise I just hear from people who want me to change things. And if you don't want me to change things, then, you know, I need to know that you like things just the way they are. You could also give me some ideas of topics you'd like me to cover or guests that you would like me to invite onto the show. So it's a great opportunity for you to not only give me some feedback, but to actually influence the course of the show. My book, oh, my book, my book is almost done. I've been saying that for weeks now, unfortunately. We keep hitting snags. There's time zone differences that are getting in the way. Uh, responses to questions have been taking way too long. It's It's been rather frustrating, to be honest. But we are very, very, very close. Uh, my hope is that it will be sent to the printers next week. And since it's basically print on demand, I think at that point they will be globally available. So hopefully next week I will have some very good news on that front. But I've been hoping for that for a couple of weeks already. So, you know, knock on wood. I have had several high profile endorsements, uh, which is great. Some people who have gotten preview copies of the book have given me some really nice endorsement quotes those are you can see you can see those on the amazon page including a great one from andy yen who's the ceo of proton who hooked me up with today's interview guest but more on that in a second the book has been doing really well on pre-sales it's still got this crazy over 60 percent off sale price i don't know why amazon is doing that no one understands amazon uh, but if you want to get a copy of the book or or multiple copies if you wanted to get some from other people now looks like a really good time to do that. Uh, hopefully the price will still be there by the time you hear this. But seriously, this is a great price on the book. I, it's honestly better than I can get with my author discount through my publisher. I don't know how they do it. But based on some pre-orders, it already cracked the top 10 in Amazon's privacy and online safety category, which is really cool and puts me in some quite good company. All right, let's get to the interview. So as I mentioned, uh, Andy Yen, who's the CEO of Proton, who I've had on the show a couple times now, uh, actually reached out to me and recommended that I interview Sun Yuan Kim, who is the CEO and founder of Simple Login. Uh, and their company does something called email aliasing, which we're going to talk all about today in the interview. Simple Logon has merged with or been bought out by Proton. So now they are one in the same company. And so Proton will be using the Simple Login service to offer email aliases to all the Proton Mail users. So what does that mean? What are email aliases and why do I want to use them? Those are great questions. Why don't we get them answered right now? Sun is the founder of Simple Login, which allows people to create email aliases. Welcome to the show, Sun. Hey, Gary. Thanks for having me. This is great. I'm really glad to have you on the show. Tell me a little bit about yourself and about what your company does. So I'm um, Son. So I created Symblogin three years ago. And uh, I created it to solve my own problem, actually. So I always love emails, but I realized that uh, I start to receive more and more spams sent to my inbox. And there are some emails that are impossible to unsubscribe. So when I think about that, I came up with a solution that, you know, in order to prevent spams, the only solution is to use a different email address for every website. So if you start to receive spams sent to an email address, you can just disable it. And that's how I started working on Simlogin. So initially, it was like for my own personal usage. Uh, but then I realized that it might be helpful for others as well. And 
that's how you know Simlogin as a project as a service was born. Well, that's great. And we definitely need more things like that. So we're going to talk a little bit today about the whole concept of aliasing and why that's so important and how it's very powerful when we're talking about both privacy and security. So we spend a lot of time and effort trying to prevent being tracked online, trying to avoid being tagged with cookies or fingerprints. But most online accounts these days require you to use an email address for your username, which turns out to be a globally unique identifier tied directly to the user. So how are email addresses being used to track us? Uh, are they sold and correlated with other sites via data brokers, or are they mainly just used for first-party tracking? Uh, I would say they are mostly used for uh, exchanging data between websites. So for example, as an advertiser, you can buy data from different websites. So you need something common in order to match that this person is the same person as you know, the other user from another website. So the common denominator is usually the email address because most people have a single email address that they use, you know, everywhere. For the third party checking, I don't think email address is is required because you can, you know you can use your user ID, you can use the first party cookie, which is maybe easier to to check. Mm. So in the old days, we used to be able to choose our online usernames, you know, which is why we had a lot of you know, handle the websites like the real Jane Doe 999, you know, uh, because when there's a lot of people on a popular service, you know, common names were used up pretty quickly. Why and when did we start shifting to using email addresses for our user IDs? So I don't know exactly when. Maybe it happened before, you know, I started working as a software engineer. But I think, you know, as a software engineer, I think shifting to email address is actually quite a natural move because we need something unique in order to store user data in the database. So initially we start with username, uh, which you know which makes things easier for, for people to sign up. But when email address becomes more and more popular and everyone, almost everyone has an email address, we start to use email address because it's easier to remember and websites can always contact you via the email address. So, you know, you can use email address for both purposes to have a unique identifier for everyone and to be able to send out communication, newsletters, et cetera, to users later. I, I tend to think that most people only have one email address, like one personal email address. They might have a work email address, but for, for personal things, I would think that most people probably have one. Do we have any statistics on that? Do we know how common it is for people to have more than one personal email address? Uh, so actually, I don't have you know any like half number on that, uh, but I think most people have multiple email, personal email addresses, because it was, they usually start with you know an old service like Yahoo, uh, so you can create an email address using Yahoo, and and once Gmail came out, mm -hmm. it became very popular. It, you know, it's very easy to use, it's very quick, etc. So a lot of people then suite the main email address to Gmail. And so from what I see in my network, you know, from my friends, from my family, most people have an old email address that they mostly never use again, and usually a Yahoo email address, and then a Gmail address. Yeah, that describes me to a T. That's exactly what I did. I mean, there was there were other ones back in the day. There was Hotmail and AOL, I think, had addresses. Back in the day, you used to get an email address from your internet service provider. So I had Earthlink accounts and I had, you know, other accounts that were based on my my service provider. But yeah, I I, I started with the Yahoo address. I still have that Yahoo address. It's a four character Yahoo address, which is really hard to find these days because it's really it's really old. And then when Gmail came out, not only did I grab one, but I thought it was so cool. And this was back before our Google was a tracking company and that was a big thing. I went ahead and got email addresses for my two young daughters who is who are like one and three years old at the time. And so I reserved, I created accounts in their names so that I could, you know, lock in those addresses for them. But so yeah, Gmail was hugely popular. And uh, I mean, now I've got tons of them, but but that's, I, I think I'm the exception. I think a lot of people like you're right. I think a lot of people have maybe changed over the years, but they probably have one that they consider their primary address and they use that probably for everything. So one, one solution to this email tracking problem, and you've kind of alluded to this, is to have multiple email IDs or aliases. So 
for most people, it's not really practical to have multiple email accounts. I mean, beyond, you know, a handful. But it turns out that a lot of email providers allow you to have more than one address for a single account. So how does that work? So, yes, yeah, so actually, uh, it's usually a hidden functionality in an email provider. For example, in Yahoo, I, I think, if I remember correctly, you can create up to 100 email addresses in Yahoo. That sounds right. So, yeah, so basically, you can have many, many email aliases. It's just like uh, the interface is not easy to find. You have to dig into the setting page in order to find the right page, yeah. in order to create email aliases. Most of them are not available. You need to come up with a, a really long address in order for the for the address to be available. And then it's not convenient to disable an address because again, you have to dig into the setting page and to disable this address if you don't need, if you don't use this anymore, or if you receive uh, you know too many spams sent to this address. And another thing is it's tied to a single email provider. Mm. So in my example, if you have Yahoo mailbox and you have a Gmail, you can create aliases uh, in your Yahoo account, but you cannot you know, receive emails in your Gmail accounts, for example. So it's tied to a single email provider. Well, one thing you mentioned Gmail, one thing that Gmail has done for a long time that I don't think a lot of people are aware of is they have what's called plus aliases, or I don't know if there's a, an official name, but that's what I call them, plus aliases, where let, let's say my name is Joe Smith at gmail.com. If I put a plus after that, I, anything after that plus is ignored by Google. So if I put, you know, Joe Smith plus JC Penney's at, you know, whatever, I, I can kind of create on the fly these email addresses and all Gmail will do is it will strip off everything after the plus, like they'll route it as if that stuff after the plus wasn't there. Is that a common thing? Does, does anybody else besides Google do that? It, and and they don't advertise it much. Yeah, actually, we made like a survey on our social media to ask them to ask people what was they using before you know solution like SimLogin exists. And actually, a lot of them use a plus check, like you said. So the technical term for it is sub addressing. Hmm. But the downside of this technique is, so let's talk about the good side first, right? So the advantage is, is really easy to use. You can come up with an, a new address very quickly. Just put plus something, a website name, whatever, and you can receive emails always in your inbox very easily. But the downside of that, at least for Gmail, is when you reply to an email sent to your plus address, uh, the reply will come from the original address mm. and not the one with the plus side. And the second thing is it doesn't really help with tracking because uh, this trick is well known. So, you know, advertisers, they can just strip, strip out the plus part to have your real Gmail address. Right, right, right. But that was that was the only game in town for a long time until some of these other services like yours came along. So, you know, some of these email providers now have these randomly generated email aliases that are specifically designed for privacy. There's been a lot of these just in the last couple of years. Apple has released Private Relay. Fastmail has had this thing called Mast Email for two or three years now, I think. And of course, now Proton, uh, now that they've partnered with you guys, has Simple Login. So, how do these type of aliases work and, and how are they fundamentally different from the, the, the methods we've already discussed? Um, so the way they work is quite similar. Uh, basically, you can create a random email address that will forward every email to your you know, normal inbox. So I think App Apple was the first that advertised about you know uh, gen generating email alias on the fly. And the fun story is a SimLogin was created around that time. Really? So actually, SimLogin was created before that. And <laughs> and then we, we we saw that Apple also came up with a solution. And, and we kind of know that it will become mainstream, right? Mm -hmm. Because if Apple decides to do something, <laughs> they will put a lot of marketing effort into it. Right. And, you know, it, it helps making email alias become a normal thing. So the way it works is, uh, you know, for every service like Apple Hyman email, Fastmail, or DuckDuckGo email, they are quite similar. I would say the main difference is uh, the support for multiple mailboxes. Mm. So for example, if you use the Apple service, you have to use an iCloud 
Mm-hmm. Uh, so this, uh, you know, you, you have to to use an iCloud address as well in order to receive emails. Uh, and if you use a fast mail, obviously you need to have a fast mail account, which is not free by default. For some email alias services like DuckDuckGo, uh, Firefox, Relay, or SimLogin, users can choose whatever mailbox service uh, to receive the forwarded email. And for some, you can choose multiple mailboxes. For example, for SimLogin, you can decide that uh, one email sent to your alias will be forwarded to two mailboxes at the same time. Mm. And this is quite practical. For example, uh, with my wife, uh, we have a common, you know, we have a lot of common aliases, one mm. for buying stuff on e-commerce website, for example. So every time someone, you know, me or my wife made uh, a purchase, the other will receive the confirmation as well. So it's, it's, it's quite nice. And for example, we have a common alias for for taxes, for example, for paying taxes. Mm. So when we receive the, the tax form from the government, and if my wife uh, replies to this email asking for more information, I also receive like a copy of the mm. reply. So I know that what she's asking for. And so I don't ask for the same thing. So that's something that I would say, which differs sim login from other email alias services that we try to make email alias more than just a hiding my email service we want to make it very easy to use uh, and it can be used for for a lot of different use cases not just for hiding my main email right and so let's talk about the reply thing that you talked about too because that's an important distinction that some of these services don't didn't for a long time fully support, which is crucial. And that is it would create this kind of, as you said, like a random email address. And you could use that and say, okay, whenever someone sends an email to this randomly generated address, I want you to forward that to this other email address. And so that effectively hiding your email. But until recently, I think in the last couple of years, a lot of these services didn't support the reply functionality. So how does, how does that work? Like, how does it, if I, if I send it to this random address, how does the system work such that when I reply to that address, it doesn't give it my real email address on the reply? Yeah. So actually, email forwarding is not a new technology, right? So it exists for more than, I would say, 20 years now. But what I usually call is old forwarding versus new forwarding. In the old forwarding way, an email is simply a reset to your inbox from another mailbox. So let's say you set up an automatic forward in in Yahoo that forwards any email you receive to Gmail. Uh, so the email will be sent from the same sender, but using Yahoo server to Gmail. And the problem with that is the email will fail authentication because from the Gmail side, what they see is an email sent from, let's say, facebook.com, but which is sent from Yahoo server. So the email doesn't look normal, right? Mm. So that breaks email authentication. And for the same reason, people cannot just reply to the email because when they reply, the reply will just go back to, you know, it will look suspicious to to, to Facebook, the original sender. Mm. So they will reject the email. And then, then comes the new email forwarding service like SimLogin. And we invent something called reverse alias which is the reverse of an alias that allows you to reply to a forwarded email. And the way it works is, is quite simple. So let's say Facebook sends an email to your alias and SimLogin will forward the email to your real inbox. And SimLogin forwards the email from an address that SimLogin creates that we call reverse alias. So when you reply to this email, you are not replying to Facebook, you are replying to the, this reverse alias. And when SimLogin gets the response, it will resend the email, but this time from your alias back to Facebook. And from the Facebook point of view, the email is always coming from your alias and there's no sign of your real email address. Right. So it, it works kind of like a proxy, it, like an email proxy. So I would, you know, I've got alias at simplelogin.com and it, I, it, someone sends an email to that. It, you said like example, facebook.com and then simple login will forward that to me. But the reply address for that email, the one that I actually received doesn't say facebook.com. I, I've seen some of these, some of them look like or alias 
underscore facebook.com or something like that so that when I reply to that, that that goes back to simple login and then simple login could look at that reply address and deconstruct it to figure out what the original alias was that that should appear to be coming from, right? That's is that basically right. how that works? Yeah. Yeah. So that that's key. So tell me again, like, so with this kind of a service, how do you use that to cut down on spam? Like, what is what is your strategy with this kind of a tool? What is your strategy for reducing or at least managing your your spam? Um, yeah. So my recommendation is always to have a different a unique email address for every website, for every newsletter that you sign up for. Uh, so, for example, I enjoy reading a newsletter. I want to sign up for this newsletter. So. I go to SimLogin, I create a new email alias for this newsletter, and then I give this newsletter my email alias instead of my real email address. And I do this for every website. And so this way, when, you know, for example, if the service decides to sell my data, or if they have a data leak that they don't know about, and my email alias ends up in the hands of, of a spammer, I can just disable this email alias. I love that. The way I haven't used, I haven't used Simple Login yet. I, since you were uh, merged with Proton and I've got a Proton account, I've been meaning to try it out. But I assume it's similar to this where with Fastmail and Mast Email, I can set these up and actually give them names. Like I can give like, uh, I can name each of these accounts so I can, I can say, I mean, usually I would pick something like, you know, uh, something that includes Macy's or something like that. But some of these are randomly generated. I can't choose what the user handle is, but they give me a way to comment basically on what account this is. So that tells me a couple things. First of all, if I start getting too much mail from that, I can just cancel it and I know which one it is. Uh, and second, if I start getting emails from someplace else the, where I did not originally give that email to, then I know that who sold me out. <laughs> I know, you know, who it was that gave up my email address to somebody else, either through a data breach or because, you know, they sold it to someone else. How often does that actually happen? Does it, I, obviously data breaches are going to happen, but do you find that a lot of these companies, I give them my email address and it's only supposed to be for them. And then all of a sudden you start getting spam from other sources for that email address. Do you find that happens often? That happened to me uh, several times already. So I start to receive, you know, strange email sent to my alias that I created for a different purpose. So I realized that, you know, they might sell my data. Maybe in their term and conditions, there's a hidden clause, mm -hmm. you know, that they can sell my data or, or whatever. But yeah, in this case, I can, you know, just go ahead and disable this alias. Yeah, that's very powerful. Okay, so because this is sort of a proxy service and that because this basically inserts the the aliasing service into the email chain doesn't that mean that these services are now seeing all of my emails what what so do i have to worry about these sites from a privacy perspective have i just introduced a new privacy problem that i didn't have before yeah so technically so for example for simblogin or any other email aliasing service uh, we see the emails coming in and we resend the email so technically we can you know analyze the email content we can do things that are not, you know, ethical, let's say. So it's important to choose the right email alias service that you can trust. So we always recommend open source email alias service. So you can take a look at the, the, the code to see what they are doing and to be assured that there's no like hidden bot or backdoor behind. Right. So for people that aren't software engineers <laughs> like you and I, who might actually even go look at this code to poke around and see what's going on in there, what do you recommend to just the average regular non-software engineer person? How, you, you say to be careful who you pick. How do you, but how do you know? Like, <laughs> how do I know as a regular human, which of these services I can trust? So it's a, I would say it's a hard question, right? It's really hard to know which service is good and which is bad. What I usually recommend is to go to some uh, privacy community or websites that do um, software reviews and to compare the the different services. They can also try, you know, some email earlier service by themselves to see which one suits them best. Yeah, that it it is it's tough. It, it's it's so hard to know who you can trust these days and. And sadly, as we've seen several times, you, you start with a company that's maybe a private company and they started out being open source and they've got all the right ideas. And then they 
somebody buys them, you know, somebody or they merge with someone else or they get this massive investment from venture capitalists and that totally muddies, muddies the waters and, and they change, you know, WhatsApp was like that, right? WhatsApp was a, a, a great private messaging service for a long time. And then Facebook bought them and making all sorts of promises about what they would not do. And of course, we all, as we all suspected, eventually they did started subverting it and started to market their customers. So even if you, even if you pick the right service to begin with, you know, making sure that they they stay that way is is also tricky, correct? Yeah, yeah, that's that's true. So one trick that I usually use is to take a look at the privacy policy of a website. If it's written in a clear way, you know, there's no jargons or or you know, third deepest longs, then it's a good site that you if you can understand the privacy privacy policy. It's a good size that the websites are doing what they claim to to do. It's also important to, like, from, uh, in my opinion, to pick services that uh, respect things like GDPR, for example, mm. because at least in that case, you can always uh, ask them to remove your data. You have certain rights with regard to your data. And for email aliases in particular, uh, one advice is to use your custom domain, right? So when you, for example, if you use Simlogin or any email or AI service that supports custom domain, you come with your own domain. So if some days, if this service went down or the service becomes really bad, you can always change to another service using your custom domain and emails will just be forwarded by a new service instead of the old one. So yeah, let's talk about that. Uh, th that's something I've recommended on this show for a long time. And before the email alias technology became more widespread and they had figured out the whole reply thing, I had decided what I was going to do was exactly that. And I've, <laughs> I own way too many domain names, but I, I, <laughs> I bought a couple for this purpose in particular. And let's talk, let's talk about how that actually works. So you buy an email domain and then you set up these catch all email addresses. Kind of walk us through that process. What, what, how do you do this and what are the advantages to having your own, do, your own domain name? Let's, let, let's leave aside like bringing your domain name to like simple login. Like if I have a domain name and I want to be set up catch all email addresses, how does, how does that work? How do I set that up? Oh, so that really depends on the domain registers that you are working with. Um, so on some domain, registers, you have to sign up for an email service, for an email inbox provided by this by the same registers. And once you activate the catch all, all emails um, are going to be sent to this uh, inbox, to this new inbox, right? So you need to go to the website to check for new emails, etc. For other domain registers, you can set up the email forwarding, like what I call the old email forwarding. So every email sent to a catch all address will be forwarded to your personal in inbox. So when you say forwarded, I, I, the way that works, at least for the ones I've set up, is actually it's DNS records. So uh, when I go to, and I use hover.com, but you can go to, you know, there's lots of others, GoDaddy and Cloudflare. There's a lot of domain registrars out there. But so when I go to hover and I set up my address and I set up the domain records so that all my email-based queries are, are sent to Fastmail, for example. And so Fastmail actually is the only one that gets the emails. They don't actually go through, they're not forwarded through Hover. They're, they would get routed directly to, to Fastmail. So it's all behind the scenes, it's Fastmail. And, and you're right. I, I, that's another reason I really like the domain name solution is because if Fastmail goes out of business, if they get bought out and start doing things I don't like, I own, let's say, mycooldomain.com. And if I don't like what they're doing, I can take that domain to some other email service provider. I won't have to change my email addresses anywhere. It'll just keep working. I just changed the DNS records with Hover to say, instead of pointing it to Fastmail, now I point it to Proton, uh, which by the way, both services support bringing your own custom domain names. So that that's one of the reasons that I like that solution. The other thing, and if it wasn't obvious from this catch-all thing that we're talking about, is the way it works is once I own mycooldomain.com, I can make up any email address I want at mycooldomain.com. So if I walk into 
uh, Subway sandwich shop and say, hey, if you want to be in our Subway club, give me your email, email address, which of course means they're going to send me junk. But I can, and, and they'll say, so what's your email address? And I'll say, oh, okay, it, it's Subway at mycooldomain.com. And they'll look at me funny, like, really? <laughs> That's your email address? But I can make up any email address as long as it it's at my domain. They will all route to my inbox, correct? Yep. So Fastmail and ProtonMail, they are email providers, the inbox providers, which also support custom domain and casual uh, address. So for any email that is sent to something at jordomain.com, it will end up in the same inbox, right? So there's no email forwarding happening. It's just normal email flow. Email is sent to this address and is stored in the same inbox. And then you have email earlier service like uh, Firefox, Relay, Simrogin, etc., which doesn't have an inbox behind. There's no storage for email. The only thing they do is to just forward incoming email to a real inbox. And for this reason, emails are not stored at all on this email aliasing service. The emails are immediately deleted once they are forward to the destination to the final destination. So some of the pros and cons of the domain name approach is the, the downside of the domain name thing is that I can't easily like disable an address because any address at mycooldomain.com will all come to me and I can't selectively say I want to turn this one off or I want to disable this one. So that will work forever. And so the, the way to manage spam is I would have to set up like a rule to say, okay, if anybody sends an email to this subway at mycooldomain.com, just send it to the trash, uh, which a lot of these services allow me to do. But it's not quite as simple as a simple login where I could just disable it and it will no longer work. But there is another advantage to doing this way that I like to talk to you about. And I have had trouble in the past, trying to use some of these relay services with signup forms, because a lot of these companies know, like duck.com is a, is, is, is a common one. The duck.go has their duck.com addresses. And if you send, set up an account with them, it's free and you can create these email addresses on the fly. But a lot of these places where you sign up for an account and they say, give me your email address, will say, no, we don't accept duck.com. Do you have that trouble often with simple login as well? And is there anything that can be done? Is there any workaround for that? Yeah, so that's something that that uh, we also receive, you know, uh, on the customer support channel. Like some websites uh, don't allow you to set up using an email alias because they think that, you know, people who use email alias uh, may be abusing their service. So to be on the safe side, they just don't allow email aliases to be used on their website. So we are on the both side of the equation, right? We we are we are a service. We allow people to sign up for 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 an account using their email address. Um, so we want to make sure that people using Simlogin are not abusing it. So we understand why websites want to prevent abuses. But I but I think it's just a misconception that uh, you know people who use email addresses are abusers, um, and we are working hard to to change that thinking. Uh, so the first step for us is to make sure that abusers will not like Simlogin. So we make sure that abusers will fight very hard to use Simlogin email aliases for, let's say, shady things, right? So for example, if they if they create thousands of email aliases to set for a thousand of uh, Netflix accounts, we want to make sure that this doesn't happen. So we have anti-abuse technologies built into our product to make sure people cannot use Simlogin for that purpose. Uh, and after that, we you know we come up to a website that blocks Simlogin and say, hey, we make sure that people don't use our service for abuse. Please unblock us. Hmm. And how often in your in your experience, how often when you go to a, these places and say, you know, hi, I am from Simple Login, and I'm here to tell you that we you should accept us because we have this long process, and here's our process. How often, when you appeal like that, do they do they change their mind? Uh, I would say it's a hit and miss uh, situation. So sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes they don't even reply. So mm -hmm. in this case, actually, in any case, we always suggest Simple Login users to contact the website. You know, to let them know that blocking email alias is not good for user privacy. And actually, it's not good for the website either, because if user has to provide 
their real email address, the website needs to be even more careful about data protection, right? If they lose their data, then uh, their customers can receive a lot of spams and it's, it's not a good image for, for them either. So the other issue that I think people should be aware of that, th that they need to think about when they do this is what happens, and I'm not saying this is going to be simple logins problem, but uh, let's say DuckDuckGo decides, or Firefox, because they've done this in the past as well, have to decide, you know what, we're not going to support this service anymore, so we're shutting it down. And now all of a sudden, I've got a 100 email aliases that they own, uh, and they were forwarding for me that all of a sudden stop working. I guess there's, I don't know if there's an answer to this question. What do I do in that case? Or how can I maybe protect myself against against that situation? And as a quick follow-up, I, I somebody reached out to me and asked me if there's been a problem with this lately because they had several of these duck.com addresses that they were using that they're stopped, they stopped getting emails. They stopped getting regular like newsletters and things. They just stopped working. And they were wondering if the service was having problems. Uh, so which made me think about this to ask this question. So do you have any advice for us about that particular situation? Is there a way to protect yourself from that? So it's a hard question, right? Because um, you never know if a service will continue to be there in 10 years, in 20 years. So one way to solve that is to use custom domain if to use your own domain. So in this case, you can just, you know, redirect your domain to another email alias in service and emails will come through again. In my opinion, you, you know, it's better to look at websites that are look at services which are financially sustainable. So don't rely too much on free services because free services, if if doesn't have enough like money coming in, you can decide to shut out anytime. Yeah. So you know, like we always say, if something is free, then you are the product, right? So. To be just be careful with anything that that is too good to be true. You know, everything is free, everything is perfect. Then there might be a cut here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so far we've talked about the privacy benefits and the anti-spam benefits of email aliases, but I argued that they actually have security benefits as well. For example, credential stuffing. When some service gets hacked people are really bad about reusing passwords and most people have just the one email address. So if I get their one email address and their one password or the password that they use all the time, I have now credentials that might work on other sites as well. So talk to us a little bit about the security benefits to using email aliases, not just the privacy benefits. Yeah. You know, you know, you know, you know, credentials, you usually have the username, which is often an email address and the password path. So actually, Password is just half of the equation, right? Right. So we also have the email address. So if we have a unique email address for every website, then in principle, our security is increased. So I always say that, you know, in, in case of data breach, losing a password is not that bad as losing your email address. Because if you use a password manager, usually your password is already random and it's different for every website. So losing a single password doesn't have, you know, maybe it's not that harmful, but if you lose your email address, if the email address appears in a data breach, then soon, sooner or later, spammers will be interested in sending you, you know, spams. And if uh, your email address appears in a lot of data breaches in different companies, then spammers, they can, kind of construct your online personal. Mm -hmm. So they know what you are doing. They kind of guess what is your profile, what is your location, etc. Mm -hmm. And they can come up with a very personalized phishing attack, which is really hard to detect. And even for even myself, I, I see a lot of spams. Sometimes it's really tempting to click on the link because the email looks so so legit mm. and you know everything is uh, is perfect the color the layout the grammar everything looks perfect and uh, we usually say you know gmail has a great spam detection but i start to see more and more spams in gmail as well yeah. so even gmail uh, doesn't have a solution which is good enough for anti-spam yeah 
Yeah, I've seen the same thing. Yahoo, by the way, is horrible. Yahoo's spam filter is just is just almost non-existent. I get these emails from Yahoo all the time that have these really funky fonts and things. And like, I can just tell by looking at it that it's obviously spam. I don't know why Yahoo can't figure that out. Drives me nuts. Anyway. Uh, okay. So, so far we've been talking about uh, email addresses and it's become thankfully very easy in recent years to generate email aliases. Now, however, it's a lot harder to create a functional phone number alias uh, and potentially a lot more expensive depending on what solution you go with. So I think marketers know this, and I, and I think that's one reason that a lot of them are starting to require a valid cell phone number when you're setting up for accounts. Some will claim that it's for security or for account recovery purposes, but it also happens to be a, a glo another globally unique identifier tied directly to me uh, and one that I'm probably going to have the rest of my life because now that it's very easy to port your cell phone number between service providers, kind of like owning your own domain name. I'm not likely to change because I don't want to have to tell everybody I know that, hey, I've got this new phone number again, you know, send, you know, now change your contacts for me. So <laughs> why is it so much harder to get a temporary or an alias phone number than it is to get an email alias? Yeah, I think the main issue is cost because you have a limited number of phone numbers. Compare that to uh, to email address, you can create as many email address as you want. It's almost free to create a new email address. For phone numbers is a limited uh, resource, so people need to buy in order to have a new phone number, and that's why having a second phone number is not very common, right? Most people only have a single phone number, and the second reason is SMS, phone calls it used to be very expensive. Like in the past, in your I guess in your phone subscription, you don't have unlimited SMS or unlimited phone calls ten years ago. Now it's more and more common to have unlimited phone calls and SMS, but it was not the case before. And so that's why buying a phone number remains an investment that people need to to be willing to, to accept. Yeah, and it's a really it's a legacy problem that we've had for I mean for decades, however long phone numbers have been around. These phone numbers are are limited because uh, it is, I mean, even if you consider international international phone calls, there's still a, a, a limited number of digits in a in a standard phone number, and so kind of like IP addresses, really, that there's a certain space of these numbers that are all kind of divvied up and bought by providers who own chunks of uh, phone numbers, and they're a limited resource, and so they can't. They just can't willy nilly get those out and you can't create them at random. The thing that kills me though, is at this point, I don't know anybody's phone number anymore <laughs> because it's always in my contact list. And I just say, call mom. Right. And I don't know. What her, and she could change her phone number. And as long as I have it in my contacts, I don't care. Cause I just call mom. When I did voice over IP work, it was all the SIP protocol, session initiation protocol, and SIP addresses were just email addresses. Basically. I'm surprised at this point that we have not gotten to a point where we don't have to use phone numbers anymore to call somebody. If I want to do a voice call, I, why do I have to use a phone number? Why can't I use an email address? Anyway, that would solve that problem, but who knows if we're ever going to get to that point. Uh, so, all right. So let's say, let's say I wanted to have, because this was sort of a strategy I had with my email for, for many years. I had a public email address and I had a private email address. I had one that I gave to my friends and family only. And then when somebody forced me to sign up for a newsletter or I signed up for a contest or for my utility company or whatever, somebody I was afraid might sell it, I had another email address. I had you know my public address. So I kind of had two. If I wanted a second phone number, if I wanted to, to get a burner number or uh, kind of a spam number that I could give out, what like, what are ways I might go about doing that? And what what cost might be involved? Depending on your country, there are several ways to do that. You know, you can just go to a local shop and buy a SIM card, right? And put into your phone and to start using the second phone number. You can also buy an eSIM, which is more and more supported by, by recent phones, right? So, uh, quite practical. You don't need to buy a physical SIM card or you can sign up for a VOIP phone number that can receive phone calls, SMS over the internet. So that really depends on on your on your needs, actually. Yeah, eSIMs are really interesting. This is something that I know iPhones have been supporting recently, and I I'm not an Android person, so I, I'm not sure how popular or how supported eSIMs are with Android, though I'm sure it's going to be become more popular. So you don't have to deal with these stupid little, and they've gotten really small, right? The, the SIM cards have all shrunk down to the size of the actual little part of the card that has the data on it, those, those tiny little thumbnail-sized things that are that are easy to lose. 
but the, it's really cool kind of the way eSIMs work. I mean, like an iPhone today, a modern iPhone today, you could have two phone numbers associated with that device. And you can at any point decide, I'm going to make a phone call. Who am I going to be calling from? And let's say I've got two phone numbers. I could say, I want my public, I want to call from my public number or I want to call from my private number. And they, under the covers, they have two different accounts associated with that. I could have a Verizon one and a, you know, Orange or O2 or AT&T or some other account on one phone. That I think is really cool. Though, of course, the downside of that is you're paying for a whole separate account, which at least in the United States is still pretty darn pricey. And then you mentioned uh, VoIP providers. T- t- tell me a little bit more about a VoIP voice over IP provider. Like, Give me some examples. And, and do they support texting as well as uh, voice uh, incoming and outgoing? I know there's each of them are a little bit different, but if I wanted to go hopefully for something maybe a little bit cheaper and not go the eSIM route, what, what are my other options? So in the US, you have some providers that can provide you with a, like, a VoIP phone number, which is not very expensive, I think. Um, so the way it works is you need to download the application on your phone, or sign up for a new account, you know, buy, buying some credit, and then subscribe to have a second phone number. So for every phone call that you receive, it's going to go through this application. So you can you know, make phone calls, receive phone calls, from this application. And I think there are uh, the, maybe the most popular one in US would be MySudo. Mm-hmm. If you type MySudo, you should see, uh, you know, you should see it in, in App Store. In EU, there's a company called OnOff, which is uh, based in France actually. And this company, uh, their focus is more on the business side. So, you know, they provide, so they work in the same principle. You need to download the application. You can buy a phone number from there and to make phone calls, to receive phone calls from within the application. But they are more geared toward business use case. So you can set up basically a CIM based on your second phone number. Yeah, I actually, I'm using one called a uh, service in the United States called Hushed which uh, I looked at for a while. It's similar to my studio. Uh, There was some crazy stack social deal on it for 25 bucks for life. So I thought, okay, for 25 bucks, I can give it a try. And so far it's worked okay. You know, like when I go to a restaurant and they say, you know, give me your phone number so I can let you know when your table's ready, even though I'm sitting right there, you know, they don't give out those little buzzing pucks anymore. They, they, they want your phone number. And so, you know, for situations like that, I, I, I got this hush number and so far that's worked pretty well. I will say, though, that kind of like, you know, email aliases, I have had trouble with trying to sign up for services using these these VoIP numbers or these kind of burner numbers. If I if I had a a second eSIM account, that would be fine. But I mean, they can recognize because these numbers are sold off in chunks again to these providers. And so there's become this secondary market of recognizing, oh, these are uh, Vonage numbers or these are UMA numbers or these are, you know, pick your VoIP provider or these are hushed numbers because they own this block of numbers. So if it comes from them, for example, I wanted to play around with this chat GPT. You know, that's really cool. I wanted to play with it. And if you go to open AI to create an account, they want an email address. Okay, great. I can come up with an alias. I'm good there. Then they want a phone number that that, that I, they can send text messages to. And I'm like, oh, I don't want to do that. So I tried to give them my hush number. They said, nope, that's a VoIP number. We don't take VoIP numbers. And they wouldn't let me do it. So I tried to give them my old home Vonage number, which is just a landline. And they said, nope, this this message can't receive text messages. You got to give me another number. And, and so I didn't do it because I didn't want to give them my cell phone number. So again, it's the same kind of problem. Do you know of any tricks for working around phone number aliases to to get them to be supported. I don't know how common it is that they're rejected, but a lot of these companies are onto this and they they want your real cell phone number. Yeah, I think it's a never ending battle, <laughs> right? You know, websites always try to block abusers and they consider people who use your IP, maybe potentially they are more likely to abuse their service than normal phone numbers. And I agree with you, it's a misunderstanding and the only way to to fix that is to to change their minds, right? To make them understand that actually using VoIP is normal. Uh, nowadays, everyone has internet, so it's totally fine to have everything transferred by the internet and not using the telecom protocol. Yeah. Mm. All right. One more question before we go, and that is thinking more broadly. I mean, there's a whole industry now devoted to looking up 
public information on people. Uh, it's called Open Source Intelligence or OSINT because we, we exist in so many different databases now, many of them public. For, like, for example, your voting records. They can't see who you voted for, but in most states, at least in the United States, you can look somebody's voter record up and you can see when they voted, what party they were registered with when they voted. You know, property tax records. There's a lot of public information that you used to have to go down to a physical office in some county, some county clerk's office. You had to physically show up when they were open, fill out some forms, and then, you know, maybe get access to marriage licenses and property records. Now it's all available online 24 uh, seven. Many of, many of these things without any, without any fee whatsoever, or sometimes just a very small fee. So before we go, as we're, as more and more of our data is online, Besides what we've already discussed, do you have any other kind of general recommendations for how do I reduce or obfuscate maybe my public data footprint and make it more hard to to, to find and to correlate all the data about me? Do you, do you have any other any parting tips for privacy before we go? So uh, the bad news is I don't have a quick solution. Like for me, the only solution is to look for the real name. Uh, you know, in a search engine, see what websites have mm. this data and then go to every website and ask them to remove their data. <laughs> that's the only way that I, I know of and it can work. And from now on, it's always better to not use your, you know, to not give your real data uh, if you don't trust the website, right? Using email address, using um, VOIP, phone numbers, maybe temporary credit cards is recommended to leave you know, as little as possible footprints because otherwise, you know, websites can identify you. The thing is, um, you know, websites used to track you, you are cookie, but now cookie is more and more banned. You know, Apple start doing that and and and, and others follow. So after the, after the cookie, they will try to find something else that will uniquely identify you. And the next thing would be email address, which is Skype logical and after email address it would be phone numbers like you said and after that i think it would be credit card mm. so it's better to start now try hmm. to not use a unique phone number or email address uh, maybe to have a secondary credit card you know for for buying things that you don't want that, that you don't really trust for example to avoid being you know to, to leave as little data as possible on the internet yeah, it's very difficult. Son, that was very, very educational. Thank you so much. It was great talking to you. Thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was a really pleasant talking. Thanks again to Sun for coming on the show. Thanks again to Andy for recommending and setting me up with, uh, with that interview. That was great. This is something we don't talk about that much, but it's a really powerful tool, uh, aliasing in general. And we need to be thinking about this more as we sign up for accounts. Uh, something else you can think about when you're signing up for accounts is, first of all, minimize the amount of information you give. Only give the absolute necessary information. Also consider uh, lying. I mean, where it doesn't matter. If you're just signing up for some dumb newsletter somewhere, you don't have to give them your real name. You don't have to give them your real birth date. Sometimes you have to you know, give them something that satisfies their need, like maybe you need to be an adult. So make sure your age is, you know, over 18 or over 21 or something like that, assuming, <laughs> assuming that is, that is true, but we need to get more in the habit of not having a bunch of correlatable information about ourselves out there any more than is absolutely necessary. Now we talked about a lot of different services today. Uh, I put links in the show notes to, uh, as many of them as I could. I also added privacy.com, which is a service that allows you to easily create kind of one off or dummy or focused credit card numbers. Like you can create a credit card for a single transaction, or you can create one for a single company. You can set limits on how much any given charge can be on that card or the total charges per year. There's all sorts of great limits you can put on that. But the, the really cool part about the, these services is it isolates you from that number. It doesn't allow you to be tracked based on that number. For the bonus patron content, I asked Sun some other questions about how he got bought out by Proton and what that relationship is and what kind of synergies they will now have being together. We got into some more technical discussions about, you know, anti-spam technologies like SPF and DKIM and DMARC, if you've ever heard of those, and even kind of threw around some other ideas of things that might help us prevent more spam in the future. So my patrons will be getting that on Thursday. 
Again, the book will be out soon. Once that book comes out, for those of you who have bought the book, I will probably be asking you to post reviews. I don't know if any of the reviews from the fourth edition are going to carry forward to the fifth. Uh, But even if they do, uh, having fresh reviews on the fifth edition is going to be crucial. So once that finally is out, I, I will probably be asking you to write reviews if at all possible. Next week, we got a news show for you. We're back to our regular schedule. I've got plenty of great interviews in the works. If you have not subscribed to the podcast, go ahead and do that now so you won't miss any of these great feature episodes. And spread the word. Tell your friends, tell your family, post stuff on social media. Let people know about the podcast. I would very, very much appreciate that. Again, fill out the listener survey if you get a chance. Let me know what you like. Let me know what you'd like me to change, maybe. Give me some ideas of topics you'd like to cover in the future and guests you'd like me to interview. Again, that's fdsd.me slash survey2023. If you want to get some top tips sent directly to your inbox every two weeks, you can sign up for my newsletter. All sorts of great ways to increase your privacy and security. Okay, everybody, that's going to do it for this week. Take care. Stay safe out there. And until next week, as always, don't get caught with your drawbridge down.